Good afternoon, church. Uh, this morning we took a look at Nicodemus and what does it mean uh, to be born again. And Nicodemus shows us that Jesus' ministry is becoming popular. This teacher is coming to him under the cover of darkness uh, to learn more. And, and Jesus' popularity is just really beginning to go through the roof. He, his first miracle, which we talked about last week, the wedding at Cana, um, that just was the first of many signs that Jesus did to point to his true, um, his, his true personality, which is fully God and fully human. Now hold in your mind that wedding at Cana. Because as John tells this story, he wants us to keep that fresh in our mind because he actually uses, um, in our passage today, he uses an allusion um, to, to part of that uh, wedding protocol. What we're going to look at today is we're going to take a look at the second half of chapter 3. Uh, what we're going to see is that John the Baptist and how his ministry transitions with Jesus' uh, growing popularity. So, one of Jesus's, um, or one of John's disciples, I should say, uh, notices that Jesus is baptizing a whole lot more people than John. And in fact, John's ministry seems to be waning. And he still had a few disciples. A lot of them have, have moved over now and have started to follow Jesus. But he has a, a few disciples who are, are staying with him. And they have this debate uh, with, the, with this Jew who's come to visit and going, what are you doing? Why are you still doing it? Jesus is over there uh, doing baptisms. And John's loyal disciples, they get real fired up. And, and, and they question uh, John about this. And what we want to do is we want to we focus in on John's reaction. So uh, chapter 3, let's pick up with uh, verse 25. Now, a discussion arose between some of John's disciples and a Jew over purification. And they came to John and said to him, Rabbi, he who was with you, that's Jesus, uh, across the Jordan, to whom you bore witness, look, he is baptizing, and all are going to him. All weren't going. But that just shows you what was in their mind, that it seemed like everyone had abandoned John, or that Jesus' ministry is growing in such popularity. Uh, John answered, a person cannot receive even one thing unless it is given to him from heaven. You yourselves bear me witness that I said, I am not the Christ, but I have been sent before him. Now, one of the things that John does here is, uh, is he recognizes the sovereignty of God. He says, look, you can't have anything unless God's given it to you. Here is John, and John is... Uh, the guy who spent all this time in the wilderness, he, he spent all this time recluse away from people. Then his moment comes where he is out there preaching the, the nearness of the kingdom of God, preaching repentance and making the road straight. And, and he gains immense popularity. And just as soon as he does, the one that, that he was to point out comes and, and is now the superstar, the rock star in the area. And so what we see is John's ministry gets surpassed by Jesus. Now, gang, let's be honest. How many times do we get jealous or upset when we see others surpass us? Things that maybe we wanted for ourselves, we see that other people get first. Or, I'll be honest with you, pastors do it. As soon as pastors get together, the first thing they talk about is how many people do you have coming on Sunday? And whoever has the most seems to stick their chest out the furthest. It's just part of the brokenness of who we are. We should all take a lesson from John the Baptist here. As John's ministry is fading and Jesus' ministry is growing, let's look at John's attitude. One of the first things we see is he recognizes that in the sovereignty of God, whatever he was given... It wasn't too much and it wasn't too little. It's exactly what God wanted him to have. So he makes this statement, nobody's received anything unless God's given it to him. And if it's what God had given uh, John the Baptist as his ministry, well, then he can rejoice in it. Uh, let's look more at his reaction. He says, the one who has the bride is the bridegroom. The friend of the bridegroom who stands and hears him rejoices greatly at the bridegroom's voice. Therefore, this joy of mine is now complete. He must increase, but I must decrease. Been to weddings, right? 
best man. The best man is the one who is taking care of the groom. The best man is the one who makes a toast. The best man is the one who takes all of the other groomsmen's tuxedos back, runs the errands, and takes care of the details of the day to make sure that the groom and the bride have an awesome celebration. Things weren't that different uh, in Jesus' day. The custom of the wedding is it was the, it was the bridegroom's friend um, it was the, the, he was the one who made sure all of the details were taken care of. Uh, we're told he was the master of ceremonies in John chapter 2. And it was his job to make sure even the, uh, the marital suite was protected. And he was the one who made sure that nobody bothered uh, the bride and that the path was clear for the groom. And in fact, um, it was the best man's job. It was, it was this guy's job uh, that uh, when the marriage was consummated and he heard the groom would shout, and that was verification that the bride was a virgin. And at that point, uh, the best man or the master of ceremonies, the, the bridegroom's friend, it's at that point then uh, when, when his job has been fulfilled. And John is saying, listen, I'm like the best man. I... I am just setting the table, making sure all the details are right for the groom. I'm not jealous of the groom, John says. I, I, I'm, not, I, I'm not disappointed that I'm not the groom. I'm very excited that I'm the groom's friend. I'm the best man. And he says, that's where I get my joy. As soon as I hear the voice of the groom, meaning it is well, it's satisfied, it's what it's supposed to be. John says, my joy is complete. He's essentially looking at Jesus and saying, listen, my job was always to set the table for him. And if he's coming on the scene and, and, and his ministry is growing, then my joy is complete. John didn't have any kind of jealousy that Jesus' ministry was surpassing his. He, he had no uh, disappointments that his season was coming to an end. No, he saw absolute satisfaction in the completion of the task that God had given him to be the forerunner to the Messiah. Even so much so that as we push on in this text, John says, I must become less that he becomes more. How many of us, if we were to be honest, can say that, can point to some other brother or sister in Christ and celebrate uh, their successes and their victories without any kind of disappointment. John for us, if you wrestle with that like I do, John for us becomes the example of humility, of understanding God's sovereignty, and understanding that we are in a union with Christ. So as Paul says in Corinthians, with one of us hurts, we all hurt. And when one of us rejoices, we all rejoice. <laughs>